but that but that's exactly the, the challenge of early stage investing, even up to the VC level, right? Certainly at the angel level, um, which is that it you never know. And nobody retroactively, you know, you can't, there's no guarantee up front. I don't care how great you are. There are a very, very few people who are what I call pickers. They are people who just have that that sixth sense and they've just come with incredible things, right? I mean, so people like Josh Koppelman at First Round Capital, um, uh, you know, Fred Wilson, maybe early on, there are a few people who just have that, you know, je ne sais quoi, I don't know what it is, but they have it, right? And, and in every industry, there are people who have a virtuoso violinist, right? And no matter how hard you practice, you want to it. So there, but putting aside those for regular, normal, ordinary, and I am not one of those, right? My, I, I am not a picker like Josh is. If I'm a rational guy, I'm enthusiastic, I'm an entrepreneur, um, and and so I would that I make all my decisions on the basis of actual data and so on. But I don't because I'm an angel, and most angels really don't. So with most angels, despite what they say, despite all the numbers and stuff they they give you, it's really intuitive. And so what you can try and do if you're not one of the pickers who has this sort of perfect sense of, and even they, you know, still miss eighty percent of the time. But the question is, the other twenty percent they get unicorns, right? So, but but if you know, if assuming that you were going to be a rational angel, and my book, by the way, was written for those people. My book was written for rational people, or at least semi-rational, trying to be an angel investor, right? Um, and so there, so the thesis of the book is get a really big, wide deal, understand what you're doing, decide what you're going to invest in, under, get a very big deal flow, and then at least understand the basics of what does traction mean, how do startups work? And so when you look at it, you know, you're not missing the obvious, right? If something is not going to work, it's not going to work. And so typically you can see that early on. That being said, you're then going to try and go for the gut instinct, the intuitive thing for, you know, the, the big future. One, one of my most fun investments, for example, um, was a company that I saw at a New York Tech meetup. Um, a New York Tech meetup was a, 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 actually still is, but it's less than it used to be. But it was a, a monthly meeting where people in the New York Tech community would show off their, their current tech. It wasn't pitching. You weren't allowed to discuss business models. You weren't allowed to, uh, you know, to pit. it was all about showing off tech. This guy gets up and shows off tech for bike sharing. And now bicycle sharing at that point had just begun to, to you know, be a, a big thing. And there were bicycle share things in New York and Washington and California. It's a bunch happening in Europe. But uh, and the first generation bike sharing was basically like in Amsterdam. You would, uh, you know, take a bike and leave it on the on the street corner and lock it up on a thing. And then everybody would have a key and you got to unlock the bike. The problem is you couldn't keep track of them and they and it was a mess. Second generation said, oh, OK, we're going to use technology and we're going to have these hubs, these smart hubs. And you would take your bike and you would lock it into a hub. So now we know that the bike is there. You can unlock it with your with a card and so on and so forth presenting a New York Tech meetup said, okay, we're going to do a third generation bike share and we're going to take the smarts out of the hub and put it on the bike. So now every bike is, well, instead of having a smart hub, you'll just have a, you can lock it anywhere, but every bike will have GPS and a built-in lock and a built-in control and, and you can see where it is and you can unlock the bike and charge it and then just lock it back up um, to a lamppost or whatever it is. And so once you do that, all of a sudden, it's now Internet of Things. You've now taken and made each of these physical bikes a digitally controllable thing. You can change the rates. You can figure out where they are. You can move bikes. I thought this was intuitively. I thought this was really cool. I mean, I just because my background is in urban planning. So I love the idea. And so we, after the, the meeting, I read on the stage and said, I, you know, as he was coming off, I said, I got to invest in this kind of company, right? Um, and so we, we started talking and it turned out that he had started, he total entrepreneur, but he was a first time entrepreneur. He'd never been started a business. Never, he'd never worked for a company before. Um, he had started this thing and they had he used his mother's money to build the first bikes in China and they were coming over, but they couldn't even get them out of the container because they, they couldn't pay the duty, import duties in the US. But I looked and so that was an intuitive thing um, where I didn't do a whole lot about, you know, the the numbers, but I thought the concept was really, really big. And so I led that round as it was the first investor. I became chairman of the board. It was called um, Social Bicycles. And they spent five or six or seven years trying to get this thesis into the bike community. And they ended up being, they had some big company, pretty good, pretty good thing. And then 
pivoting and, and adding on it, they hit on the idea of powered bikes, of electric bikes that were pedal assist bikes. And they were the first people to do that. And they came out with that and they got a deal with San Francisco. So they were the, the first bike share allowed to, to test these bikes in San Francisco. And it worked really, really well. Along the way, they changed their name to Jump Bikes. And then they started, all of a sudden, they hit it. And that was their, their experience in bike share, the cities they were in. was re and, they, and this thesis, now that everybody else was beginning to get onto the idea of, oh, put the intelligence in the bike so you can see where it is and check on your smart smartphone and unlock it, which is now the standard way of doing these bike shares. These guys pioneered that. Um, and then PS, all of a sudden, they found themselves in a very hot market. Uh, they were they had term sheets from all the major VCs, and they ended up getting acquired by Uber. And that was the, the beginning of Uber bikes. So from this little company that I had seen was the first investor in. And so that was a case where you had an intuitive, you know, made intuitive decision, spent a lot of time working and adding value with the other investors on the board and helping the CEO, and then helping them to an exit and everybody benefited. David, how are you? Welcome. And thank you very much for accepting our call today and invitation for this podcast. I'm fine. It's my pleasure. Looking forward to it. So if you were giving a lecture about angel investing 101 at a university, what, would, what should be the syllabus and what should you tell in the first lesson for your students? For angel investors, I will tell you that angel investing for the right investor can be one of the most fun, rewarding, and lucrative things you can do, but there has to be an appropriate match to the investor. It's not right for everybody. Um, but if you're the kind of person for whom it is right, it's really wonderful and a lot of fun and you can change the world. What will be the syllabus for the all semesters look like? Uh, some maybe the main points. Well, it's funny you should ask that because I happen to have written a book on the subject called <laughs> Angel Investing. <laughs> Best Guide to Making Money and Having Fun Investing in Startups, uh, which has 25 chapters and goes through from beginning to end everything you should know. But in essence, the syllabus would be first an introduction to investing um, so people can understand what is the um, uh, what it's all about, putting it in context. And then having done that, then you go through the mechanics of how to invest. And the first thing is to understand the specifics, the economics of it. So you have a really good understanding of angels, their investments, angel funds, the various forms and, and contracts that are used to invest money in a startup, how startups, their economics work, how you get your money back, what the timeframes are, and so on and so forth. Then it's a question of how do you get to see a lot of companies? So that's deal flow. And there are multiple ways of getting deal flow. Then having gotten a lot of companies in, you have to decide what is it that you're actually going to be investing? You have to have a thesis. Every investor has a thesis. When that thesis is can be very broad, which is I'll invest in things that I like, which is very broad to be almost meaningless, or it can be very, very narrow. I'm only investing in SaaS platforms at a Series A in Turkey, which is a, a relatively narrow kind of thing. You have to have a thesis. Then the question is, how do you look at these companies and how do you analyze them to make sure that they fit your thesis? Number one. Okay. Now you've got companies that fit your, you found companies, they fit your thesis. Then you have to do diligence on your, on all these companies that now meet your thesis to decide which ones are most likely to be successful. And you're looking for the upside because for an angel, you have to ultimately hit the very long, big returns, right? So how do you find the unicorn? So you have to hope for a unicorn. If you're investing in a company that at best can be worth a million dollars in two or three years, that may be a wonderful company for somebody starting from nothing and for their family, but it's not the kind of company that an investor can invest in. Uh, and so you want to hope and plan for the upside, but you have to be sure that if it doesn't quite work, and this is where I differ from some other angels, other angels will tell you, okay, you got to go as big on the upside as possible. And it doesn't matter if it doesn't work because you're gambling on the upside. I would tell you that you have to be rational on the downside also. So even if it doesn't get to be a super unicorn, can you at least have a viable company on the downside? And then by this point, you've taken a big opening group of companies. You've cut it down by thesis, by whether it works, by looking at the upside and the downside. Um, and then you're looking at these companies in terms of the founder, right? It's We call it betting the jockey, not the horse. You want to know somebody because no 
business in my entire investing history has ever worked exactly according to plan. So therefore, if the plans change, you're betting on the founder to change with it. And so you have to make sure that you all the things that in my uh, talk that you've referred to, um, that whether it's integrity and passion and experience, all those things, you have the right founder. And then at the end of the day, you make sure you're compatible with them. The, the company is meeting your thesis, that you have an appropriate upside, that you protected the downside. And then you make sure that the documents are all legal and straight and very clear as to what's going on. And then you go for it. You were an early pioneer angel investor. So what originally drew you to this type of investing and how has the landscape changed over? I am actually, I'm a, I'm a fifth generation serial entrepreneur, but I'm actually a third generation angel investor. And I'm not sure I know I have ever met any other third generation angel investors. So my name is David S. Rose, and I was named after my great uncle, uh, the first David Rose, who was born in the 19th century. And he was an active angel investor. He was the angel investor behind the portable kidney dialysis units, vascular stapling, hyperbaric operating chambers and hospitals. Uh, he personally invented through the wall air conditioners, um, desalination projects in the Middle East. So this is a guy who when I was, a, was growing up and he would tell us these stories about um, these things he was investing in, everybody else back then, this is many, many half a century ago, everybody else thought he was completely crazy and this was some whatever plaything. I found these absolutely fascinating. So I knew from an early age that you could actually have an impact and, and invest in these kinds of companies. So, but I am an entrepreneur first and foremost. And so I started out as an entrepreneur. I began starting companies when I was 10 or 12 years old started companies throughout high school and college and business school and after business school and during the dot-com boom. And then along came the dot-com crash. And at that point, I had uh, a company that had become a multinational, had raised tens of millions of dollars in venture capital. Um, we're doing all kinds of things, cover of PC Magazine. Uh, and the dot-com crash happened. The whole world came to an end and that company evaporated. Um, so at that point, um, I moved from temporarily from the, the uh, bright side of being an entrepreneur to the dark side of being an investor. And so uh, I joined the local angel group here in, in New York uh, and started making angel investments. If I couldn't start a company myself, at least I could help and support entrepreneurs who were starting other companies. And that was actually a very interesting time to invest because we called it the nuclear winter. After the dot-com crash, VCs at that point had raised enormous amounts of money. I mean, $200 billion was sitting in, in venture capital bank accounts, but they were so scared because of the dot-com crash that they didn't weren't investing in anything. So the only people who were investing in startups were these crazy angel investors, and therefore valuations were very, very low. You're talking about valuations at the 1 million, 2 million level, not today's seed valuations of 20 million. Uh, and so you had an opportunity to invest in some really interesting companies. And so that's how I got started uh, doing that. And then being an entrepreneurial type, I realized that angel investing was actually a very uncoordinated and inefficient operation. So I finally got back into the business, started a company called Gust, which you know, which today is the infrastructure platform for most of the angel groups in the world to make it more efficient and more effective. And then with that started, the rest is history. Do you remember your first angel investment? If you go back to your first angel investment, what would you like to tell yourself about this angel investing journey and what are the frequently made uh, mistakes of all the angel investors? So when I began angel investing, my first angel investment was probably well before I became an official angel. It was probably when I was still an, an entrepreneur, even before that, when I was, before I had started, when I was working in a, in a, uh, like for a family business. Uh, and a friend had a company that I thought was interesting, so I invested in that. But that was more of an investment as a friend. That really wasn't a thoughtful, considered angel investment. After the dot-com crash, when I became seriously in the, you know, angel investing, and I had to join this group of other angel investors, and angel groups, by the way, are very, very helpful. They're a wonderful way to understand the market, to learn from other people, to get angel mentors and the like. So um, the first, one of the earliest deals that I invested in 
there, I actually, my, my first two deals were very interesting. One of them was from a, a company that was, that was doing mobile um, applications for uh, air conditioning service people and plumbing service people. And it made a whole heck of a lot of sense because the, back then plumbers and electricians were dispatched using paper. They would call the office and so on and so forth. Very inefficient. And we were just having the first mobile devices come out. And so the idea here was to connect everything digitally on a mobile device so you could actually get the appointment and, and check in the result and check for parts and so on and so forth. It was a brilliant idea, but there were two problems with it. And in retrospect, looking back on it now, one of them was the founder, while a, a very nice guy and a smart guy who put his own money in, was not really an entrepreneur in the sense that in my book, in chapter four, I discuss, you know, the entrepreneur, capital T, capital E, somebody on whom you are betting your whole investment. And this guy was a nice, great guy, but he didn't have that sort of fire in the belly. He really, he wasn't able to sort of shift with the time. So that was problem number one. And then problem number two was I didn't really do my research. Intuitively, it made a lot of sense, but I didn't do my research by actually talking to potential clients and saying, hey, customers, would you use this? And it turned out that back then, this was so early before the iPhone, before Android, before mobile devices, before everything, that the idea of using a mobile for a plumber to use this high technology mobile device was crazy. They thought people were insane. So nobody ever bought this thing. It was a, a total disaster because it was way ahead of its time. So that was my, my, my first unfortunate experience. On the other hand, my second deal was <clears throat> I was investing in a brother sister team. And that's, by the way, very interesting. Husband and wife teams can be very problematic in terms of investing because you have family dynamics and sexual dynamics and partnership dynamics with, on, on the side. But I have found that investing in siblings is actually really good because if you, if you go with sort of business with your brother or sister, you don't have the, the family you know, tensions that you have in a husband and wife, but you have people who have known each other their entire lives, know that they work well together and know that they want to do this. So actually, so this was a brother sister team. She was the CEO. He was the CTO. Uh, and uh, they were doing some, uh, some design software in, in middleware design software for designers to connect them to pre-press things and so on. And I was really impressed with the team. And that was a good choice because she was a great, a great founder. And they had had a previous investor who had really sort of screwed them up and had, had defaulted on something and was trying to get back. And so they were doing a restart. And so I invested uh, in that one. And within uh, a year and a half, they had actually been acquired by Kodak. And so that was a 10x return on my second angel investment. So that's it. Oh, whoa, you can really make now. I haven't had that kind of return you know, in many years since then. But, you know, having a, a one experience where I learned a, some hard lessons about how to do it. And the second experience, uh, which was, made me a lot of money, was really very nice. And so that's how I sort of got started. What do you see for the current angel investors frequently mistakes? The mistakes that angels make when they're new angels is not really understanding the whole universe. And that's why my book is such a really interesting place for people to start. So if you're even thinking of being an angel investor, I really would strongly recommend my book because it gives you the whole beginning to end you know, picture of what to do, how to do it, and the overview. So uh, angel investing, if you do it right, it will. You know, it is far from a slam dunk. It is far from a guaranteed you'll make a lot of money. It is very risky. It is about as risky an investment as you can ever possibly conceivably make. But understanding that, if you do it thoughtfully and correctly with investing in a lot of companies over a lot of time with a real process and understanding what you're doing, you can actually get very decent returns um, and, and have a lot of fun while doing it. Um, and so the, the biggest problem with new angel investors is they don't have that context. They don't understand really what they're doing. They may understand one particular product, but they don't understand the idea of a company and a startup and how that works. They may know the founder and love the founder, but they don't understand the product or something else. So you really need to have a full understanding of what you're going into before you write that first check. The biggest challenge that we see in angel groups where you actually have experienced members who are, are, are nurturing and helping new members, a new member comes in um, and they've been thinking about it. They maybe somebody has shown them a deal in the past that they didn't want to do. They come to the angel group and there they go to their first meeting and they see two or three or five companies pitching. Now, these companies have been, you know, five out of 50 that have been applied to pitch. And so they've carefully been, they've refined their pitch and they've practiced and they're really perfect. And so the new angel comes in, looks and sees five 
five companies, all of which sound amazing, because of course, every startup founder, when they do their pitch, it shows it's going to change the world and be a unicorn. So they see five things and they, and they, and then they talk to their other angels who are there and they invest in, in one of these things. And then they come back the next week, uh, next month for the, to the angel group. And they see another five pitches and they're all equally wonderful. So they make a second investment. This is, this is really great. And then they get to the third month and they come in and they see five more pitches and they want to go make another investment. And at this point, their spouse says, um, you know, well, wait a minute. Yeah, How much of our money are you going to be spending on, on doing all this angel stuff? Let's take it easy a little bit. And so they begin to then hold off and they wait a few months. And then by the time they get to the sixth or eighth or, or tenth month, that first company they invested comes back and says, oh, you know, you know, it's really great, really exciting, but it didn't quite work out. And so we really need to raise another round. And can you please put in some more money into this company, which is the first time they realize that the value of their portfolio doesn't only go up, it can also go down a little bit. Um, and then, and at that point, if you can get through your first year or two and make a two or three angel investments and actually keep going and still want to do it, that may be a sign that you're potentially a good angel investor. Would you like to be a venture capitalist or angel investor? Oh, no, uh, absolutely an angel investor. I mean, I am a venture capitalist and I'm a, uh, a founding partner in True Global Ventures, which is an international super angel fund that is now doing blockchain and, and AI. And I've been a limited partner in some other venture funds. But no, I am very much an angel. People have been asking me to, to do venture funds for 20 years at, at this point. Um, and the, they're very, very different things. Um, an angel investor is investing out of their own pocket, their own money for their own purposes with their own thesis. You're responsible only to yourself and your spouse, and you can do what you want. The minute you take other people's funds, you are now a fiduciary and you are investing other people's money. And the biggest responsibility now is to them. Everything, anything you want to do is completely secondary, has to be, because you're responsible for somebody else's money. Uh, and so you can't necessarily take the kinds of risks you would take for yourself, make decisions that you would make on the basis of, you know, whether you like somebody or integrity or like the thesis or whatever, um, you're really beholden to somebody else, number one. Number two, being a venture capital investor is a long-term play. Typically, venture funds are 10 years with the potential of another two or three on top of that. And that means you're committed. You can't, if you're an angel investor, you can say, okay, I've invested, I've invested in five companies. Now I'm going to take a break for a year. I'll go on vacation. I'll... You can't do that if you're a VC. If you're a VC, you're stuck there, you know, minding investments of other people's money for 10 years, responsible to them. You can't walk away from it. It's a very, very different thing. So no, I I'm very much an angel investor as opposed to a VC. What are the difficulties managing a network and what are the advantages and disadvantages of the angel network? So there are, again, two sides, angel, you know, people who join angel networks and people who run angel networks. Um, so for people who join angel networks, a good angel network is a wonderful thing. It is absolutely the best way to get into angel investing um, because A, Think about the problems that you have as an angel. You need deal flow. You need to understand terms. You are writing small checks as an angel, so you can't play in bigger deals. Um, you don't necessarily have the expertise across all of the various subjects in which you'll be investing. All of those can be overcome with an angel group, because in an angel group, you have other people who are, in theory, more experienced than you and can mentor you and advise you. You have people whom you can bounce off your ideas and discuss things, so it's not a, a single decision you're making by yourself. You have the ability to add your check to their check. So now instead of 10 people each making a $25,000 investment, which is small for and on the receiving side, you now as a group can make a tour investment. And that's a significant thing. That means you could actually lead an investment round and set the terms. It means you have other people around you who can help the company by providing leads to sales and leads to um, other investors in the future and help in advising and mentoring the CEOs. So doing, and then of course you have lots and lots of deal flows. You have deal flow, you have people to advise you, you have have other people to sound off, other people to help the company. You can uh, aggregate checks into a larger check. So for all those reasons, joining an angel group is by far the best way to get started. Now, on the side, coming ladder from the perspective of somebody who's running an angel group, I've always said that, that angel groups are inherently unsustainable. 
And every time I say that, my friend Brian Cohen, uh, who succeeded me as the chairman of New York Angels and who wrote the book, uh, What Every Angel Investor Wants You to Know, um, Brian kicks me because he says, how can you say that these groups are unsustainable? But my, my point is that if you think about it, an angel group itself is not out to make money. An angel group itself is really a not-for-profit organization of individual people who are out to make money from themselves. So the people want to make money, but the group itself doesn't. Uh, so therefore, you know, groups, because they are supporting individual angels and individual angels are rich people or richish people, as I like to say, um, who have other things to do, don't have time to run the group. So somebody has to sort of help manage and run this group. So you end up with somebody, a professional group manager or administrator or somebody to help organize all these angels and running a group. And here comes the problem. If they're very, very good at it, at good at helping to identify companies and shepherd deals and add value and so on, that's sort of what a VC does. So eventually that person gets so good at it that they go off and start a venture fund, the kind of thing you're doing, right? On the other hand, if they're not good at it, they're not very good at getting people to write checks to companies. And so the group dies because they don't do any good deals. So so therefore, if the, you, you, the group can't make money, you can't pay anybody appropriately to run the group. If if somebody is good, they end up leaving to be a VC. And if they're bad, the group doesn't make, make any money. The only way an angel group works is if somebody who is capable puts in more time into the group than they're getting out of it. So somebody has to effectively sacrifice themselves for the good of the angel community. Um, and so there are just enough crazy people like us running around who do that. And so the people who um, devote their time and effort, angel investors who are writing checks and investing, but who also manage to to take the time to help get the group together and manage the group and run it and bring people. I, they have a special place in my heart, people who run angel groups, because that's what the best way is to get started as an angel investor. Do you still uh, look for business plans? Only PowerPoint decks or PDF decks, are they enough for investing? So there's a misconception as to what a business plan is, and things have changed over time. A business plan is effectively the roadmap for what you are doing as a company, what your what the problem is, what your solution is, how you implement the solution, how you operate the company, projections as to what you think you'll get in terms of sales and revenue and costs and profits down the line. <clears throat> so it used to be in the old days, if you were starting a company that required funding, you didn't have a company. You had to say, okay, here is the roadmap for what I'm doing. And you would take that and you would take that to a bank or you would take that to an investor and say, here's the plan. Can you provide the funding to get this started? Because the company couldn't get started on its own. You needed to have all kinds of products and tools and services and so on and so forth. One of the things that has changed is that over the last 20, 30 years, we have had this explosion of technology. And now you can start a company for literally nothing. Not every, um, company, not every company. company. You can't build a nuclear power plant for nothing. But for the kinds of companies, the high growth technology based companies, there is so much available in terms of platforms and tools and open source and gig economy and everything else that you should be able to get something going if you have no money whatsoever. And so, therefore, <laughs> the business plan is not a financing doc. You don't say, here's what I plan to do, give me money. That doesn't work. Now it's what have you done? Here's what I've done. Give me money, number one. So, so therefore, a business plan, while in the old, old days, was maybe written to get money. That's not true anymore. A business plan, however, is still very important for the founder because it, it's your roadmap. It shows you what you're going to do, where you're going, and how do you know where you're going to go if, <laughs> if, and how you're going to get there if you don't know where you're going, right? So, so it's a business plan is very much internal. It's an internal document for the founder, number one. But number two, the form of the business plan has changed. The business plan is no longer a, you know, 35 or 40 page, you know, single spaced, you know, typewritten thing about here's what you are, are going to do. Instead, you can, there's now something called the lean business plan. Um, and the guy who actually wrote the original great business planning software named Tim Barry, um, who wrote Business Plan Pro, which was the 
by far industry leading software. Uh, and now their company is doing something called Live Plan, L I B E P L A N, liveplan.com, which will actually walk you through um, the, you know, the whole process of doing it. And he actually ha he has his own website called leanplan.com, which is totally free. He wrote a book about how lean business planning, which is available free online, absolutely great reading. And the point it makes is you don't no longer need a 40 page type detailed textual thing. A business plan now really is stuff like like a business model canvas. It shows, so we're identifying the major issues, the major points over here, looking at the numbers. And so the baseline projections, what's your business model? How do your costs and revenues work? So yes, business plans are still very important, but they're not financing documents, they're internal documents. Instead, what an investor wants to see him or you're trying to match your thesis, the what the company is doing to your thesis. And so when I talk to entrepreneurs about how you pitch, Remember, an investor has a thesis, broad thesis, narrow thesis, but they know on some level what they want. And so, for example, I don't invest in things like gaming deals or beverage deals or, you know, entertainment stuff. That's not what I do. Medical, medical drug discovery. Not what I do. They're not bad industries, not bad business. They keep me a lot of money there, but that's not what I invest in. So if you give me a new drug you know, discovery, I'm just not going to invest in it. I don't care if it's a cure for cancer. That's not what I do. So therefore you have to hit my thesis. Now a company on the other hand is doing something. The company has a thesis as well, right? They are doing X, Y, or Z. And if I am, if, if they are a beverage company and I don't invest in beverage deals, then they're not gonna turn around and say, oh, all of a sudden we're a SaaS company, right? So, so the goal for the company when they're raising funds is to try and identify investors whose thesis, at least generally, fits whatever it is you as the company are doing. And then in your presentation, in your pitch, you want to be as clear as possible about what you're doing and how it will work. And so then I, as an investor, say, oh, okay, this is in my thesis. This is in my wheelhouse. And I see what you're doing. I like what you're doing. That's what I'm investing in. And here's how I see you can make it work. And you don't need to have, you know, 40 pages of business plan to do that. Instead, most investors can do a, a cursory look at something. And it can tell you within one sentence, if it's within their thesis, can tell you within, you know, five slides, if it's within their thesis and generally matches their idea of what a company should look like. And within, you know, 10 to 20 slides can say, oh, this is a really interesting company. I get it. I know what they're doing. I like the background. I like their business. I like their thesis. Okay. 20 slides. I'm in if, right? So it's a yes, if. So with a 20 slide presentation, you can always get somebody, if they are the right investor, to say yes, if. Yes, I like what you're saying. And assuming if everything you're saying is true, and I can do diligence to customers and your sales and the product and everything else, then I would like to invest. So how do you make the due diligence in your angel network and who is responsible for it? So in our case, in New York Angels, which is the group that I still belong to, obviously, I'm uh, you know, chairman emeritus, um, we have deal teams. And so basically when a company first applies, they apply online through Gust. Um, we probably get 200 applications for funding every month. Uh, and so the first thing that happens is the professional staff, we have a, a full-time you know, small professional staff, looks at it and says, okay, this is clearly not within our, our universe, so forget those. But of the remaining companies, there may be out of the 200, maybe 100, uh, they say, hey, here are 100 companies that have applied this month. And then we know on Gust which angels are interested in which particular areas. And so you will, so I will get a, a list every month of saying, oh, here are, you know, 10 companies in prop tech or fintech or SaaS or whatever. Um, please do a quick review. And so then again, using the Gust platform, all of our angels go through, look at the, at the whole application, which includes the pitch deck and financials and background and executive summary, effectively of a, of a business plan, sometimes a full business plan. <clears throat> and, they, and we say, okay, on a scale of one to five, one star to five stars, is this company one that we should bring in to our screening session? That's the only question we ask. And so you know, as many angels as, as want to or interested rate each of these companies in areas that they're interested in. Uh, and as a result of that, a few weeks before the, our, our monthly screening session, we look at it and say, okay, we've identified these are the 10 companies that have the highest scores that people think we should see. And we invite those companies in for a screening session. 
Um, historically, it was all in person. These days, increasingly online. So we can have a wider catchment of both investors and companies. And so the company then presents for 15 minutes, give us their pitch. There's Q&A with the investors there. And the goal of that, from our perspective, is to see, does anybody who was watching that thing, are they interested in potentially investing? Not are they committed, can't commit on one thing, but are they interested in learning enough more that they might want to invest? And so then we look around and we say, okay, we have, you know, eight people or 10 people who are interested. So then we will do a deep dive meeting, a session with the founder. After that, we're saying, okay, here are the 10 or 15 angels who saw it at, at, at screening who might be interested in learning more. And then you do a deep dive. And then out of that, the question is, okay, who is ready to raise their hand and invest if everything can be worked out? And if we have at least one or two people, um, doesn't require the whole group, we have 135 members, at least one or two who are prepared to say, I'm very serious about possibly investing, then they work with the founder and they will either lead and develop a term sheet, which where we will lead, or if the founder has a term sheet from somebody else that they're investing, they'll say, you know, can we live with this? Uh, and then once we get somebody, at least one member, to commit to investing in this company on this term sheet, then we get to bring that deal to our monthly meeting. And every month, the third Wednesday of every month, we have a session where we'll typically have three companies that have passed through that present to the whole group. Every one of those companies has been diligent, has had a term sheet negotiated, has at least one member who introduces the company and says they've committed to invest on this term sheet. Uh, and then it presents to the group, both in person and online. And then we have, you know, who's interested. People say, okay, they're interested in investing, maybe five, 10, 25 people. Uh, and then on the basis of that, we then hold another session. It takes a lot of work and effort here um, with the founder where they go into, say, it's a two hour session where they'll go into detail with all of these angels who are interested in investing and, and do review the diligence and review what they're doing and answer questions. And then again, using the Gus platform online, we say, okay, who was committed and how much are you committed to invest? And so you track the, the deal book that way to see, make sure who's investing. And then once we have uh, enough committed to make the deal closed, we then go ahead and close. So that's the way. So there are multiple stages of diligence from an initial review to a deeper dive before we do a term sheet to a deep after the term sheet, and then a final diligence session after we have all the members who are considering investing. It looks like a also long process. In some hot deals, the rounds are very quickly uh, filled up with lots of VCs or angel investors. In these situations, how do you um, update your process? And therein lies the really big question and problem about angel investing. Remember, I've been doing this. We, New York Angels is now 20 plus years old, right? And so this has been the question for two decades for the entire angel industry, right? There is a very, and that's the, the essential difference between an angel on the one hand an venture capitalist on the second hand, and if you have three hands, an angel group on the third hand. And the big difference there, an angel can make a decision because you're reporting to nobody except yourself. You can make a decision like this. I can see it, I'm in, boom, I wanna do this deal, right? It can literally, it can take zero seconds after you hear the pitch to make an investment. And so founders love that, especially if you can write a big check, but the answer is most angels should not do that because that's not a really smart way to invest, but they can. VCs typically can't do that because VCs have a fiduciary responsibility to their LPs. And by the way, VCs invest in one tenth the number of deals that, that uh, angels do. Angels will you know, are, are more promiscuous because they're writing smaller checks. A VC typically is writing a check in the millions of dollars. Uh, and so and they will invest in, in many, many fewer deals. So they have to be very serious about it. So they may like a deal. They may say, hey, I want to do this deal, but they're going to have backup really serious diligence. They're going to have their associates. They're going to go through it. They're going to have several meetings typically and look at a full deal memo. And if, if they're, if they are being asked to lead the deal, it would take even longer than that. So that will typically for a VC, you know, to get involved will typically be sometime between, you know, call it weeks, right? Um, at least I've, I've never seen any VC, I think, really making, uh, except in unusual circumstances, a decision in less than two weeks. And typically it's, you know, more like four to six by the time you go through the pitching and then meet the partners and meet the, do the diligence and give them the stuff and they do reference checks and then you have the partner meeting and then you do the thing that ends up being typically, you know, two, three, four weeks or, or longer. 
An angel group, however, remember, you don't have, it's not a VC where they're getting paid to do this and they have a whole process and so on and so forth. And there are two or three people who are making the decision, maybe you know, a three-person partnership or if it's a, a small fund, seed fund, one guy himself or two people. An angel group, you've got, ah, you know, okay, we have 135 members at New York Angels. So we have in any particular deal, since we don't, we don't write checks as a group, each individual angel writes a check, but you're still herding chickens. And so the, the idea of trying to streamline the process would be great. The entire Gust platform is based on the idea of streamlining the process, which would be great. That's the thesis. Unfortunately, in the real world, when you're talking about individual people, most of them are former entrepreneurs, all of whom think they're brilliant, who were investing money out of their own pocket, which is not uh, unlimited, and they want to know what everybody else is doing and want to do this, it unfortunately takes a long time. So yes, that's a, a basic problem. Angel groups typically cannot move as fast as VCs, and certainly not as fast as one individual angel deciding to write a check. That being said, you, what you get on the other side is you are harnessing the power of a group. You're getting a bunch, hopefully, of smart people who can really add value. As an individual angel, you get to aggregate your checks with, with other people. Um, and because angels typically will invest in deals that are not quite VC ready, um, they're still early stage. You get to invest at an earlier stage at better valuations than when VCs, VCs typically are prepared to wait for later, higher valuations where there's more assured chance of success. Angels are a little less risk averse and are willing to take a flyer and it, it, they know they're going to lose most of their, their investments. But if it works, you make a whole lot of money uh, in, in doing that. So one way that angel groups get around this, or at least try and make it better, is they will create a fund. And so some, so most angel groups are still based on the way New York Angels is on individual angels deciding to write checks in individual deals. <clears throat> what increasingly we're seeing now are angel funds, where a group will get together. They will say, okay, Brock, you want to uh, join our group? That's great. Everybody put in $50,000 or whatever into this fund. And then when somebody pitches us, all we'll do is we'll take a vote. <laughs> what, do, you, do we want to bet? You know, we'll, we'll have a process, but that process can be sort of streamlined. And then because we're not talking about individual angels, angels, we're talking about a group vote. That can happen very fast. So an angel fund is typically the fastest way to get a, a deal investment done for an angel group. Um, but yes, the process is a problem, always has been a problem, always will be a problem. And I'm not sure, I will say this advisedly, knowing more about this than anybody in the world, I'm not sure that there is any real way to make it much better, despite the fact that we've really all been trying for 20 years to do that. Thanks. What are your total investment, investment committees, committee. angel group decisions, and also individual angels making investment decisions? Which approach do you believe is most effective? They're, they're all different, right? And they're effective in different ways. So if you are a solo angel, you're investing your own money. Nothing is stopping you from investing in the craziest thing you can think of or a safe thing you can think of. Um, you can make a decision instantaneously um, and you live with what you invest. And in theory, if you're good at it, you'll make money and you'll keep doing it. And if you keep making bad decisions, you'll stop being a solo angel, right? Um, angel groups. On the one hand, you're benefiting from the experience and input and wisdom and thought processes of multiple other angels. And because they are joining an angel group, they are at least in the same universe that you are. Somebody who's totally risk averse is not joining an angel group, right? So they're, the average angel investor has been an entrepreneur for 15 years and has started three companies. Um, so you're, you're people who are sort of like you and they're sort of willing to take risks. And the fact that they've joined a group and are angels means they are inclined to make an investment, but you're right. There is still groupthink and there are some people who will be more conservative. So on the one hand, it might tend to stop you from investing in crazy things that you should never invest in because you're hearing some common sense from other people. But on the other hand, it may indeed, you know, prevent you from, you know, making your own investment in something that's a wild, crazy thing, which is why most angel groups are great for bringing things in. But, you know, as a group, they will only, you know, make a round robin investment in a few deals. But individual angels can still say, okay, I know the group didn't want to do it, but I like this deal. So I'm going to invest anyway. Right. And so you, you can, you can still do that. Um, with, with venture funds, having a, especially funds that are not just a single uh, VC, you know, seed fund, but they have a, they have a partnership. Um, typically, 
if they're a good VC fund, the part those VC partners have gotten together. They believe they are simpatico. They are clearly willing to take risks and and invest in this space if they're an early stage VC because that's how they raise their their funds. They signed up with their partner because they believe they each have something different to bring to the table. And they're having. I mean, I know for a fact. I mean, I being primarily an entrepreneur, I'm a future thinking, far future, you know, risk taking, whatever. And it's very helpful to me to have somebody who's a little more grounded advising me and and, and working with me and discussing things through to say, okay, yes, sure, it'll change the entire world and we'll go to Mars next week. But you know, in the real world, what do we do? Right. So so and that's why venture funds, when they work, um, tend to be able to make the, you know, the, the big hits. But there are remember two very different sort of types of venture funds. The traditional big, big funds that are that are investing in a series A or or forget to often when I talk to investors in private equity and say, well, yes, you know, we're 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 early stage um, you know, uh, PE investor. I say, great, what does early stage mean to you? They say, oh, you know, we don't we'll invest as early as series B. Okay, right, you know, fine. I'm investing before anybody ever heard of the term series, right? I'm investing with a guy in a garage. Um so so typically venture funds have invested in series A. For an angel, series A, that's like your exit. That's like the end of the day coming out of here, right? Um, so they are prepared. If they are investing at that kind of level, they are looking for a lot of traction. They have the company has been de-risked a whole lot, and now they are betting that they can their money can be used to expand the company, not start the company, right? Angels who are investing really, especially in a pre-seed round or an angel round, are investing before any proof of anything, really. We say we demand traction and we really want traction, but it's still typically well below product market fit, well below, you know, everything else. So you're investing on founder, you know, market fit kind of thing. And so, you know, that's an interesting challenge you know, to do. And that's why angels tend to invest in these crazy early stage deals and VCs tend to invest later. A seed fund, a, a seed fund or pre-seed fund, a venture fund, where you have effectively, it's a small fund, 5 million, 10 million, um, the kind of funds that you're doing, where you essentially have, you know, one former angel, now sophisticated angel, who is making decisions, you know, you can be sort of the best of both worlds, right? You're, you're not having, you don't have a big, long partnership thing to go through. You can make a decision, but you're being, you know, in the back of your mind, you've got LPs there. So you have to be serious. You can't just take a flyer and a gander. You have to be serious about what, about what you're doing. So, so you may be in just the right sweet spot here. Most of the times, the great companies are non-consensus companies. And nobody knows in the early stage. So how do you make your decisions? It, based on intuition or data. But that, but that's exactly the, the challenge of early stage investing, even up to the VC level, right? Certainly at the angel level, um, which is that it, you never know. And nobody, retroactively, you know, you can't, there's no guarantee up front. I don't care how great you are. There are a very, very few people who are what I call pickers. They are people who just have that, that sixth sense and they've just done with incredible things, right? I mean, so people like Josh Koppelman at First Round Capital, um, uh, you know, Fred Wilson, maybe early on, there are a few people who just have that, you know, je ne sais quoi. I don't know what it is, but they have it, right? And, and in every industry, there are people who have a virtuoso violinist, right? And no matter how hard you practice, you want to put it. So there, are, but putting aside those for regular, normal, ordinary, and I am not one of those, right? My, I, I am not a picker like Josh is. But I'm a rational guy. I'm enthusiastic. I'm an entrepreneur. Um, and, and so I would that I make all my decisions on the basis of actual data and so on. But I don't because I'm an angel and most angels really don't. So with most angels, despite what they say, despite all the numbers and stuff they, they give you, it's really intuitive. And so what you can try and do if you're not one of the pickers who has this sort of perfect sense of, and even they you know, still miss 80% of the time, but the question is the other 20%, they get unicorns, right? So, but, but if, you know, if assuming that you were going to be a rational angel, and my book, by the way, was written for those people. My book was written for rational people, or at least semi-rational, trying to be an angel investor. Right. Um, and so there. So the thesis of the book is get a really big, wide deal, understand what you're doing, decide what you're going to invest in, under, get a very big deal flow, and then at least understand the basics of what does traction mean? How do startups work? And so when you look at it, you know, you're not missing the obvious. Right. If something is not going to work, it's not going to work. And so typically you can see that early on. That being said, you're then going to try and go for the gut instinct, the intuitive thing, 
for you know the, the big future. One, one of my most fun investments, for example, um, was a company that I saw at a New York Tech meetup. Um, a New York Tech meetup was a, a, a actually still is, but it's less than it used to be. But it was a, a monthly meeting where people in the New York Tech community would show off their their current tech. It wasn't pitching. You weren't allowed to discuss business models. You weren't allowed to uh, you know to pitch. It was all about showing off tech. This guy gets up and shows off tech for bike sharing. And now bicycle sharing at that point had just begun to, to you know, be a, a big thing. And there were bicycle share things in New York and Washington and California. It's a bunch of happening in Europe. But uh, and the first generation bike sharing was basically like in Amsterdam. You would, uh, you know, take a bike and leave it on the, on the street corner and lock it up on a thing. And then everybody would have a key and you could call, unlock the bike. The problem is you couldn't keep track of them and they and it was a mess. Second generation said, oh, okay, we're going to use technology and we're going to have these hubs, these smart hubs, and you would take your bike and you would lock it into a hub. So now we know that the bike is there. You can unlock it with your with a card and so on and so forth. Presenting a New York Tech meetup said, okay, we're going to do a third generation bike share and we're going to take the smarts out of the hub and put it on the bike. So now every bike is, well, instead of having a smart hub, you'll just have a, you can lock it anywhere, but every bike will have GPS and a built in lock and a built in control and, and you can see where it is and you can unlock the bike and charge it and then just lock it back up um, to a lamppost or whatever it is. And so once you do that, all of a sudden, it's now Internet of Things. You've now taken and made each of these physical bikes a digitally controllable thing. You can change the rates. You can figure out where they are. You can move bikes. I thought this was intuitively, I thought this was really cool. I mean, I just, because my background is in urban planning. So I love the idea. And so we, after the, the meeting, I rushed onto the stage and said, I, you know, as he was coming off, I said, I got to invest in this kind of company, right? Um, and so we, we started talking and it turned out that he had started, he a total entrepreneur, but he was a first time entrepreneur. He'd never been started a business. He'd never worked for a company before. Um, he had started this thing and they had he used his mother's money to build the first bikes in China and they were coming over, but they couldn't even get them out of the container because they, they couldn't pay the duty, import duties in the U.S. But I looked, and so that was an intuitive thing um, where I didn't do a whole lot about, you know, the, the numbers, but I thought the concept was really, really big. And so I led that round as it was the first investor. I became chairman of the board. It was called um, Social Bicycles. And they spent five or six or seven years trying to get this thesis into the bike community. And they ended up being, they had some big company, pretty good, pretty good thing. And then pivoting and, and adding on it, they hit on the idea of powered bikes, of electric bikes that were pedal assist bikes. And they were the first people to do that. And they came out with that and they got a deal with San Francisco. So they were the, the first bike share allowed to, to test these bikes in San Francisco. And it worked really, really well. Along the way, they changed their name to Jump Bikes. And then they started, all of a sudden, they hit it. And that was their, their experience in bike share, the cities they were in. was re and, they, and this thesis, now that everybody else was beginning to get onto the idea of, oh, put the intelligence in the bike so you can see where it is and check on your smartphone and unlock it, which is now the standard way of doing these bike shares. These guys pioneered that. Um, and then PS, all of a sudden, they found themselves in a very hot market. Uh, they were they had term sheets from all the major VCs, and they ended up getting acquired by Uber. And that was the, the beginning of Uber bikes. So from this little company that I had seen was the first investor in. And so that was a case where you had an intuitive, you know, made intuitive decision, spent a lot of time working and adding value with the other investors on the board and helping the CEO and then helping them to an exit and everybody benefited. In this case, you, you know the vertical and the industry. If you don't know the industry or the vertical, do you invest or, or what do you do in this case? If you don't know the vertical and you don't know the industry, you should be very careful about investing. That's not a great match, right? You, you know, even if you totally know the industry and the person and the model and you see it, it's still going to be a one in 10 chance of being successful. If you have no idea about the industry, anything sounds good. I mean, if you don't know, I can give you a perfect pitch. I can convince you to invest in something in an area that you're not in because you don't know anything about it, right? But it, and, and so very often, uh, that, that's a problem for founders as well. Um, it's like, you know, I, I joke that it's like a founder pitching me a new building 
a real estate building, a building in New York City, and he's got a wonderful site. It's going to be a giant skyscraper in the middle of an eight acre open area right in the middle of Manhattan, you know, and so I should just invest in the building. So my question would be, okay, you know, there probably is a reason why nobody has built a building before in the middle of Central Park. And if you don't know what that reason is, you probably shouldn't be you know, doing these things. So similarly for, for investors, if you really know nothing about the, the market, that's not a considered angel investment. You could be taking a gamble. You could be investing in a friend. You could be doing something else. But that's not the way you should really, you should really, un if you want to invest in that area, go learn the business, right? You know, and, and by the way, investing a little bit of money in one startup in an area that you want to know about is actually a pretty good way to learn about it, right? So if, if you know going in, you're not doing it to make money, you're going in it to learn, then putting in 25,000 into a med tech device company or whatever, or a drug discovery or a you know SaaS platform, and if you're really willing to, to see what they're doing and watch and talk to the CEO and look at, read all the reports and learn about the industry, it can give you some very interesting insight, but you shouldn't be trying to make money in an area about which you know nothing. Lots of industries and sectors has been disrupted by the technology, but not venture capital capital, angel investing. Uh, what do you think about uh, the evolution of angel groups, for example, in the face of emerging technologies? Because AI is coming. Gust has also put a great value for the angel groups. What do you think about these emerging technologies? What are your thoughts about that? Okay. I'm not allowed to, I'm, I'm kept a very tight check by my team at Gust. So I'm not allowed to pre-announce anything, but you happen to, there, there is a lot of stuff that's happening in this space. We've recently become very involved with a really interesting company called Thinkable, uh, of which I'm actually chairman now of the, of the board and invested in, um, one of my latest angel investments. And it is an AI company that is a, all about using AI to create AI companies. And so it's, it is a meta AI company. And it, it goes through by using AI to generate the chains of thought that ends up actually creating a business. And so they've got, you can check them out, Thinkable, they've got some, their first thing to demonstrate it was how to write a screenplay, right? So the question, okay, how do you write a screenplay? Well, it goes on for, to write a screenplay. You have to have the characters and the plot and the set. Blah, 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 blah. Oh, how do you find a character? Blah, 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 blah. And so they it, they generated this entire thing. It's called Plot Dot, and you can now use AI to write a screenplay. It asks you these questions, that question, and the next questions, and then out comes the screenplay. They then they did one uh, called uh, Patent Graph, which lets you generate patents, and they're doing things to search for search for grants with Grant Genie, which we're announcing next week. Um, and so you're using AI to create companies. Um, the challenge with using AI to make angel investments has been a question of data. A combination of, so there's a lot of data on public companies, but they're not angel investing, right? And but and they are public. Angel companies are private. Well, okay, there are things like PitchBook and, and uh, CB Insights and uh, other things that let you see private companies, but you don't really have, they have some data, but a summary, it's not always accurate at the level you need to make a decision. The data you get from an angel company at an angel level is not available. So what do you do? So there are, I'm going to try not to pre-announce something, but suffice to say that there are in the in process now, some interesting groups coming together that have combinations of really powerful AI technology, really powerful things for investors to analyze and manage portfolios, really powerful things to aggregate lots and lots of startup companies with standard metrics and data. And if you put that all together, which is, and is happening now, it's starting to happen now, and you will see this come out within the next you know, six months to a year, year and a half, and I believe that this potentially will give you the ability on a global basis, not just in Silicon Valley or New York, but on a global basis to access all those cool companies in Turkey with all of those cool investors in Canada, you know, who are, are, are matching, who have a thesis and you have a company. And I think so. So keep looking at Gus. <clears throat> I can't tell you what companies going to be doing this, but just, you know, there will be some really interesting things happening in this space going forward. So you're right on target in looking at that. Uh, startup accelerators like Y Combinator 500 tech stars have been very popular for helping early stage uh, companies, and there are lots of accelerators now. In your opinion, what core values these structures accelerated programs provide and uh, to startup founders and young startups today? Do we need acceleration programs nowadays? It's very interesting. So, when accelerators first 
uh, happened, first came out, and the very first one, of course, was Y Combinator. It was a breakthrough because be be before that, you had incubators where companies would just rent office space effectively and do it. Um, the idea um, of Paul Graham behind Y Combinator was to actually identify really great companies and provide them lots of mentorship and some cash up front and tools and so on and so forth. Uh, and so when they, so that's why Y Combinator did amazing, amazing stuff. And so that was explosive. You then had a number of others come in, became really prominent, big ones, 500 startups, the folks out of um, uh, Techstars, the folks out of SOS Ventures, um, which had a whole bunch of accelerators. Um, these were amazing. And for that point in time, they brought this thinking about how to do a great startup to people who had never seen it before. They would identify people. But now, in the, over the last 10 years, the world has gotten so connected. Everything has moved so fast. Um, and, that, and both the time to market has moved fast, the, number, the amount of resources, the stuff you're doing, the stuff I'm doing, from this podcast to Gus to all these things have made all this information now much more readily available. And so the accelerators, all of them, have had a very challenging time in the last one, two, three years, sort of post-COVID, about what their role is and, and how to, to do this. Uh, and so I think the era of the traditional accelerator, if something can be traditional, it's only 15 years old, but I, I think those accelerators are sort of moving. We at Gust have a program now um, that we introduced about uh, three or four months ago, which has proven to be phenomenally successful. It's called Mission Control. And it's not an accelerator program, it's a subscription program, but what it does is it gives you access to all the Gust tools and all of the Gust, the, the blogs and videos that you've, you've seen. But more than that, it gives you on a weekly basis, you know, one or two sessions online on Zoom sessions with other founders, with experts from Gust, with experts, investors from, from the industry and experts in accounting and tax and so on and so forth, which provide the founder with wherever they are with access to really high-end experts personally, where they can ask questions about their thing, where there's a, a continuing context and they're in a shared tool space. And so I think something like, and it's much, much less expensive than, than an accelerator, and, it, and it's, it's much more broadly applicable. So I think that you're going to see new breeds of things like mission control and other ways doing it, ultimately superseding the Excel. I mean, why Combinator had um, startup camp and so on. I, I think you're going to see more scalable universes because the traditional Traditional accelerator is sort of turning into venture funds and other kinds of things. How do you motivate yourself to overcome challenges when you fail or f feel tired personally? So unfortunately, I can't be helpful with the answer to this question because I, I either benefit from or suffer from uh, a unique psychiatric condition. It's actually technically called hyperthymia. I am a happy, optimistic person. I was born that way. I always am 24 seven. So I never get depressed or sad or, or, or scared or whatever. It is. So I just go through life causing havoc for everybody else. But way to, the way to do this, now my recommendations are, right? Um, the way to do this is to keep your yourself grounded. To, you don't try and risk more than you know you can lose. If you're an angel investor, you have to know that every dollar you put in, you can lose. So do not invest more than you are comfortable of completely writing off. Right. So then that takes off the existential end of the world. Right. If you are only gambling effectively with money that, you know, you can you can lose, then you don't have that dread behind you. And then you try and do the best job you can of it, making it work. And you have to be realistic, because if you go in knowing that angel investing is really tough and the odds are against you and the odds are against the startups. And, and therefore, if a company fails and believe me, the majority of companies I've ever invested in have failed. Even the majority of companies I've, I've actually founded, they fail. But that's part of being an entrepreneur. If 90%, you know, if you have 10% of companies who really succeed and, you know, 1% become a unicorn or whatever it is, the others didn't work, even though good people made rational decisions and tried to make it work. So you have to be on some level, at least partly philosophical about doing that. So how do you keep learning? And also, what kinds of books have you recently read? Uh, I, there are some, you know, there are lots of books and actually there are a few books about angel investing. So I was the first, mine was the first, and I think it's still for your listeners is still the best, right? It's called angel investing, the Gus guide to making money and having fun investing in startups. Um, uh, it's still 
completely valid, although it's a little bit U.S. centric. It goes through all the stuff we were just talking about and helps you understand the context. Uh, there's there's another book um, called Angel by Jason Calacanis, which is the other approach to investing. Jason, who I've known for 30 years, uh, is now out in Silicon Valley, and it's it's all about the home run, right? It's all about you know investing in the one unicorn, and the best way to do that is by drafting along other investors who are doing that. You know, forget the downside; it's all about the upside. And there's another book called What Every Angel Investor Wants you to know by Brian Cohen, who we discussed, my friend, who succeeded me as chairman of New York Angels. And that's a a somewhat more balanced thing about looking at it from how an, for a founder, about how an angel invests, right? And then there are the the great books by Brad Feld um, about, uh, you know, venture deals, how to be smarter than your lawyer and VC. And he's got a bunch of others that are, are, are great as well. So you want to read the basic books in the industry to understand what you're doing, and then you want to actually do it. But beyond that, my suggestion is just to keep a pace with what's happening in terms of development. A new book that I just got um, that just came out literally, I think, this week um, is called Trivergence, T-R-I-V-E-R-G-E-N-C-E, uh, by Bob Tapscott, who's Don Tapscott's brother. And it's all about how the coming you know, change en route to the singularity, which we haven't discussed at all, but with the, the future of advancing technology accelerating at an exponential fa- pace that I've been very involved with for, for decades. I'm an associate founder of Singularity University. Um, and that's how the whole world is changing there. But, but Bob's take on trivergence is that the three most important of all of these 10 dozen, 20 converging trends, the biggest ones are the question of AI, of blockchain, and of Internet of Things, IoT. And those three things coming together are fundamentally going to change the world en route to this technological singularity when technology has advanced so fast we can't even contemplate it, right? And that's supposed to happen by, you know, no longer than, you know, 20, you know, 45, right? So we're looking at, you know, 20 years from now. And so I think the best thing angels can do is to keep abreast of what's happening. If you haven't started playing with ChatGPT or or Claude or one of those things, you should do it now. You should read these books about these questions. Ray Kurzweil is coming out with a new book called The Singularity is Nearer, based on his original seminal work, The Singularity is Near, about this kind of stuff. So just keep reading, soak up every bit of information about everything. And that's the way you keep up to date on the whole angel world. David, this has been truly been inspirational and insightful discussion. Thank you for sharing your wisdom and experiences, all of us. It's my pleasure. Thanks so much.